All right, everybody. We got our next talk by these two gentlemen, uh, Karthik and James. They are amazing people. They're co-organizers for DevOps Days, and they're going to give us a great talk on security in the fast lane. Take it away, guys. All right. Hey, thanks, everybody. Um, we're really excited to be here. Uh, this is a talk on serverless security, and it's uh, it's really the same talk we gave at uh, Serverless Days Austin. Mm -hmm. So if you were at Serverless Days Austin and you're like, oh yeah, I saw these jokers before, feel free to leave. Like we you won't should, be offended at you all. You should go to the <laughs> other side where they're talking about other serverless kind of stuff too. Yep. So serverless everywhere at this time. Cool. Uh, all right. Well, so who uh, who are we? So uh, I'm, I'm James Wickett. Uh, I I recently uh, moved jobs. I'm now no longer at Signal Sciences, but I'm more at Verica. Uh, I'm also an author on LinkedIn Learning. Uh, if you want, uh, I put the slides on Twitter, but if you have any questions from this or you want any, uh, and to find me, you can hit me up at wicket at verica.io. Uh, and my name is Karthik. Uh, I work at Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, um, or Oracle is the big company, um, but we like to say OCI because we do a lot of cloud stuff uh, now. I'm a developer advocate there, and uh, cloudnative.oracle.com is where you can find a bunch of the content that we publish. So where we're going today is, um, it kind of feels a little weird with a mic. Um, so we're gonna talk about uh, serverless is really hot topic, security is really hot topic, but uh, the ecosystems are a little bit separate, so we kind of want to bring those together. So we want to talk about how security fits in the serverless kind of mold. Uh, we'll talk about one idea that James and I have been throwing about, uh, we call it WIP, and so we'll talk about the WIP model. Um, and we'll talk about some of the work that James has been pioneering uh, with respect to uh, lamb hack and uh, it's, uh, no lambs who are harmed in that. And then we'll talk about some provider tips from uh, serverless providers. So first questions first, what is serverless? If you haven't seen this before, like everybody has a definition. Uh, our specific definition is that, you know, serverless is like encourages functions to be deployed as single individual units. So we talk a lot about microservices. It's like a small uh, little way to be able to deploy uh, you know, your applications, which are coupled with third-party services uh, that allow you know, end-to-end uh, -end applications running without worrying about like, all the stuff underneath or system operations. Yeah, that's right, Karthik. And, and I, I like what Adrian Cockroft said. Uh, this is uh, a little while back, I guess, wait, now three years uh, ago. He says, yeah, you know, a lot of people are thinking of serverless as PaaS and other mm -hmm. things like that. But uh, hey, if you, if you can officially run PaaS and, uh, and start instances in 20 milliseconds, run them for half a second, then you're welcome to call that serverless, right? Kind of tongue in cheek there. But really, we, we think of serverless as this like progression that we continue to, to march forward. So. Uh, and, and we're, we're continuing to, to find value in our IT systems, and so I really think of serverless as being that IT value. On the left, you know, we had our hardware, uh, and uh, we were only really getting a certain amount of value for it, uh, you know, 10, 15% over time. Then we said, let's chop those into smaller boxes, and that sounded mm -hmm. like a great idea. It was a cloud, we loved that, and then now we're just paying for what we can, what we consume, and so we're, we're really trying to unlock that value, and that's, I see more, more promise of that. So I really like that idea of uh, serverless as IT value, but Karthik, one thing you said uh, just a minute ago was like, hey, we're not worrying about system operations. So like, we actually, actually with some of the serverless stuff, we saw the whole right. like, yay, no ops, like it's all wonderful again, much like we did uh, not, not too long ago, uh, you know, when the cloud came out. And so, so and, and I think that with that, like a lot of people are thinking, now I get security for free too, because I don't mm -hmm. manage the OS or do any of that, that, that other type of uh, dirty business. Like, no longer do I have to worry about uh, security. But we're gonna talk about that. Like, that's not really the case. It just kind of changes, uh, changes it. Uh, operations, uh, th this is one of the talks that Patrick gave a, a couple years ago at a serverless uh, days. I was just telling him, I was like, I really like that, and that was a really helpful, helpful way to think about it. But he, he would often say like, the problem with serverless and the, that we're going to continue to experience as we move to these microservices models and these approaches is like t for operations, now the burden is for like to keep all that stuff straight in your head. And like that's a really difficult thing to do. Um, and uh, when you, when you yeah. just look at it, even the most simple like uh, diagrams, it's like, okay, like how is ops supposed to do that today? It, it really feels like we keep shifting, um, you know, what, what we do. So like we have innovation either on the dev side or on the ops side, but 
none of the stuff that we've learned before goes away. We just end up adding like a new layer or like adding like a different thing to it. So, uh, you know, like we have on the slide yeah, over here. Well, yeah, and this is one of those old axioms. This is like, you, you can't really, you, we think that like technology burden is just gonna evaporate, but like we're just changing it to other layers. We're switching it to providers, we're, um, or we're changing it to other groups, we're trying mm -hmm. to figure this out. Um, but, but the truth is like that, that same axiom applies to security too. So whenever we're thinking about it, like we don't, we know we're no longer thinking security is just gone, right? The security, security burden is not created or destroyed in serverless. Right. It's merely just transferred to somebody else. But this is, this is, I think this is a problem because I, I, I'll kind of go with the tenet of the, the premise that security is in a crisis system, the or a situation right now. Uh, we've talked about it in the, in the main track and we were talking about like, hey, security is sort of facing the same pressures that uh, operations has, has faced, you know, five, 10 years ago. They're undergoing this whole DevSecOps movement. And we see some of the same markers that we saw back then uh, with operations. We see those uh, happening with security as well. Uh, we have this inequitable distribution of labor. So, you know, we kind of commonly were like, all right, yeah, every mm -hmm. 10 developers, there's an ops person. That's a natural siloization or um, cylinders of excellence, as Wendy said yesterday. I, I like that, yes. you know. But but you, you sort of had this natural divide, this chasm between these these two groups. And then, then we've amplified this out with, uh, with security, right? It's like every 100 or, or so, right? Interesting point. Uh, this quote is actually in the book Accelerate, and it's quoted by this guy named James Wicket. Oh, geez. Okay. Anyways, but the point is, like, it's not actually the real numbers. It's the, the point is, is that you're, we're, we're, si we're sitting at a, a place where we have this uh, order, of ma order of magnitude problem. And so um, now the new world of, of serverless and kind of how we've been moving, I love it. Like, this actually, this is easier for me. Like, there, there are some big benefits. Like, the old OSI model, I was always confused. But now, um, that's about the funniest the talk's going to get. Yeah. So, <laughs> just FYI, all right? The, um, well, uh, yeah, so, well, let me, let me, I'll just kind of hit, hit, we'll finish up the security pieces mm -hmm. here, but I think security knows that they're in, in trouble. Um, and the proof is, like, uh, Steve Loven, he has this quote that I, in his recent book, Thinking Security, he's a, uh, he's a, a, a longtime writer in security. Uh, he wrote, like, the book on firewalls in the late 90s. Um, so he's an insider in the security organization. He says this, companies are spending a great deal on security, but we still read of all these massive computer-related attacks. Clearly, something is wrong, and the root of the problem is twofold. We're protecting the wrong things, and we're hurting productivity in the progress, in the process. Um, so we're not, we're not letting the business, like, move forward and be progressive and, and, and make the changes they need, uh, and, like, we haven't stopped any of the breaches. So it's a particularly damning statement. Uh, Michael Zalewski, in his, his book, The Tangled Web, he says, uh, he kind of has this opening chapter where he kind of, like, walk security through the last 50 years, kind of by four and five year chunks and looking at uh, like what security cared about. But he says security by risk assessment introduces a dangerous fallacy that structured inadequacy is almost as good as adequacy and that underfunded security efforts plus risk management is about as good as properly funded security work, right? So in the late 90s, we sort of made this trade off like we'll just do actuarial things and like we just like start doing uh, compliance and checklists and things like that. Um, and we see this in like uh, surveys as well, like the recent DevSecOps survey, which is, which is the in, which is like with the SANS organization, which is a security uh, security group. Uh, they said while engineering teams are busy deploying leading edge technologies, security teams are still focused on fighting yesterday's battles. And uh, also, depressingly, 95% of security professionals spend their time protecting legacy applications. Uh, and Agile Application Security says many security teams work with a worldview where their goal is to inhibit change as much as possible. So I just kind of say all this to like, let's, this leads us to one of these main points of like, the serverless model just doesn't fit into the security team's <laughs> worldview. And that's, that's where we see this as a bit of a problem. And yeah. we're led to this question. Yeah, I feel like uh, we've kind of depressed our audience. Uh, yeah, so well, that's the... about like <laughs> all the stuff that's like all sad and stuff. So like... My, the funny joke didn't land. So uh, now I'm worried. So, okay. And now, now everyone's depressed. Anyways, so like how do we change this? So we've been like thinking about like different patterns that, you know, we can try. And one of the ideas that we have is this uh, concept called WIP. And okay, I can take, uh, take over. So we call it WIP, and so a secure WIP for serverless is basically, um, it's three things. The W is for write, I is for inherited, which is like the code that you actually get, you know, whether it's a provider or whether it's, you know, a code that you're using. And then P, uh, which is provided, and then that's the container that you provided. 
So this is you know similar to the idea of DevOps, where you know it's all about collaboration, and it means like more secure, more collaboration uh, from the perspective of DevSecOps. Uh, we're both really big Indiana Jones fans, so we really want to add an H to this because we like whips. Um, but give us an H. Yeah. So if someone has an idea for an H, uh, Wicket or Iteration One, just tweet at us, and uh, we'll try and like ac accommodate that into the framework. Um, so, but everyone has these like glorified ideas and statements, but like, how do you actually do it, right? Um, one of the nice things about serverless is it's uh, a lot of it is provider driven, right? So when you use uh, serverless platforms, whether it's uh, you know functions from Oracle, uh, Lambda from uh, AWS, or you know uh, from Azure or Google uh, as well, like the provider actually helps you with a bunch of things, like they help you with the high availability, scale, scaling, installation, etc. And then you, as a developer. Uh, you're kind of more responsible for your application, so your app data, authentication, um, you know, your actual code, and the dependencies associated with it. So, like, just the application is the stuff that you're worrying about, not not everything else. Um, when you're looking at it at this from a security perspective, uh, OWASP, uh, which is, you know, a pretty big um, security organization, they actually have a top ten. So they have a, they've had a top ten forever. Uh, and that was one of like the first things I actually learned as a developer. I was like, oh, OWASP top 10. Here, here are like the 10 most common things that developers make mis mistakes on. And they actually did this in 2017. They did this uh, specifically for security. Uh, and so they have like A1 through uh, A10 with like injection, broken authentication, uh, and like a whole bunch of whole bunch of others. You can download the slides. And you know, some of these things are super relevant even in the serverless world. Uh, specifically, injection. Uh, broken access control, uh, misconfiguration, which is like happens all the freaking time. Um, components with like known vulnerabilities, where you know you'll use a container, and then tomorrow you're like, oh crap, this actually has a struts vulnerability in it. Uh, and then insufficient logging and monitoring, which I thought was really cool. It's like one of those things that uh, we take from the uh, you know from the DevOps world, and you know security is also kind of talking about it. So we'll talk about these. So uh, secure whip. Let's take a look at the right part. Uh, and specifically uh, OWASP A1 injection. So this is where any of the data coming into your applications, uh, as a quick definition, that data you can actually trust it. it might be hostile, uh, might be like 99% of the time we think, hey, everything coming in is safe, but we can't really think that way. So this is very similar, like we've been facing this in web apps all the time, like, yeah. hey, yeah. Uh, you know, cross-site scripting, all of that stuff too. So um, you know, front-end frameworks have kind of shielded us from that. Uh, but now when we're working in the serverless world, we might not have that shield. So, uh, you know, you're, you're like Captain America with no shield. Oh, so, geez. a little bit scary. Yeah. Um, and then, so what, you sh what should you do? Keep your data separate from commands and queries. Uh, you know, same advice as uh, we have for REST services from, uh, you know, past lives. Uh, verify that you're actually, like, sanitizing your data. It's like, same old story, right, uh, from before. Pay attention to input validation. Uh, I, I remember all this time at NI where people were like, are you validating your input? And I was like, no. And then it's like, okay, I'm well, like, why I mean, would I do that? Yeah. Uh, I, got, I got knocked out by the DevOps teams over there. Uh, ask Ernest if you want funny stories. Um, and then use uh, whitelist validation wherever possible. So I like this idea of being able to, like, if you, if you, if you can, make sure you have, like, create a whitelist. So, like, everything that's allowed uh, into your system, like, uh, try and validate it against that um, because that's always, like, a great pattern. From, uh, let's move on to broken access control. Uh, this is kind of where uh, the users can, or should not be able to act outside of the stuff that they're intended for their permissions. Uh, this is, you know, weird things like, you know, URL modifications. So we, we'll have like a demo on this, uh, on the lab hack, lamb hack uh, side of things. But, uh, you know, sometimes we, we're, with REST services, we're kind of smart, so we start adding, you know, things to headers, to metadata, et cetera. And uh, from a from a hacker perspective, folks kind of take that and try and like mess around with that to see if they can break uh, our actual software. Uh, token expiration is like a very common thing. Like you'll get in, you'll get a you know email with a token in there, uh, and say, hey, this thing uh, you know this thing's valid for 24 hours, but that token might not actually expire in 24 hours. Um, what do you do? Uh, so have like a deny by default strategy. So. Don't trust everybody. Like you would never keep your front door open to your house. You keep closed, and you know. So like, have a deny by default strategy. You open the door when you need to. Um, have an access control mechanism in place. So you know. So you know. Okay, whether it's RBAC or something else, 
Um, you know, think about those things before you, you know, deploy your applications. Uh, rate limiting, uh, this is one of those things that comes up a lot. So have a rate limiting strategy for uh, your tooling and then also log the failures. Don't log the sensitive data. So if somebody's username password fails, don't log the username password in your logs, uh, but say, hey, there was a failure uh, with, with a login request. Okay, well, uh, yeah, so uh, there is a problem with serverless that uh, we start thinking like, oh yeah, we're really secure. So we kind of mentioned all the kind of the, the stuff before and then uh, Karthik mentioned those two, two vulnerabilities. And so like, I, that's sort of where it kind of got me thinking. Um, I had these uh, s developers would tell me like, oh yeah, but like, you can't do command execution through the API gateway. It's not possible. Like, because you're, you're safe. Like, the gateway is like, that's, you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, you can. And so um, I was like, I was like let's, let's see about that. And, I, and these are security people or security conscious people that were telling me this kind of stuff. And uh, anyways, I had enough of it happen, and I was like, all right, we'll, we'll, just, we'll see if we can do this. So that is where I decided let's, um, let's write a vulnerable Lambda uh, and put it in through an API gateway stack. And uh, I just wanted to make the point that application security is still relevant in serverless. Mm -hmm. It's not a fully baked uh, version, but it kind of came out of the whole idea of like WebGoat and, and RailsGoat and, uh, and all those sort of things, um, like OWASP Juice Shop now. And um, all right, so we like the goats. Uh, good, all right, all right. <laughs> um, OSI model is, is dead, you know, goats live on. All right, uh, so yeah, it's bad, that's, that's good. <laughs> I love that. I like it. I'm gonna use that. Uh, anyway, so uh, Lambhack, what is it? It's a vulnerable Lambda, has the API gateway built into it. Um, it's pretty pretty simple, no like data backends or anything to it. Um, it's open source, MIT license. Uh, and the only thing you can do with it right now is like arbitrary code execution in a query string like through a URL. So you're taking kind of some URL parameters uh, and then we're gonna break out and we're basically like making a, a uh, we're, oh here's the next slide. Basically, it's a reverse shell uh, in HTTP query strings for Lambda. So it sounded like a, a fun idea to do. Uh, so this is the kind of the main, there's a bunch of other like uh, bits with it. It's using a Go Sparta, uh, which uh, to help uh, kind of be the wrapper for it and set up all the, all the Amazon bits for it. Uh, so let's look at a couple pieces. So the first uh, piece that's interesting, uh, we have Lambda event query param uh, just takes in like the arguments uh, off of that. And then it just goes over to the runner and says, hey, you know, that thing that I just got, like, you should run that. Does anybody see any problems with this so far? This is great code. I would, it would pass a code review. No, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like I I'm just taking stuff right off, right off the args and then I'm just, like, pumping it straight over and not really doing anything with it. And we're saying, oh, I'm sure that underlying function will clean that up, which, you know, that often doesn't happen. Um, so we can run make provision. I ran that just a little bit earlier today, so we can break over and take a look at it. Um, but you, all you got to do is get your uh, out of that uh, kind of long list of stuff whenever it provisions. You just want to grab your your value for uh, uh, mm -hmm. whatever your gateway is that you're going to be using, and then um, I have this. Uh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Just so for our example, like I have a, a lambda shell helper, so I'm just, just going to be typing lambda shell. But under the hood, this is what it's doing. It's uh, just calling that URL, and it's doing some like things to make the command line look slightly prettier and like my ghetto bash there. Um, so, so these are the args? That, uh, oh, yeah. oh yeah, no, so we're just, we're just uh, whatever you put in, uh, uh, yeah, right, whoops. The there value, you. yep. Right, yeah, so, so, any, so $1 is whatever I'm typing. So basically I'm able to just type, uh, you know, like I'm gonna type, uh, you know, cat uh, Etsy password or whatever, right? And that's just gonna pass in here, and then that goes straight, uh, like curl through, through there uh, across the way. Uh, okay, so Lambda shell helper, and so the, the rest of the demo, like, or the rest of the slides kind of go uh, with just like using the, the curl type commands, but we're just gonna go ahead and pull over to the, uh, the actual demo. So we'll see if it's, it's working. Well, you never know with these kind of things. Uh, let's see, I'll exit this. Live, live demos are always fun, especially when they work. Uh, it's like you can. Here. Okay, uh, yeah, so that's, the, uh, that's that uh, Lambda shell uh, mm -hmm. thing, and I got, already got my, uh, my URL up there earlier, so I'll click that, and uh, uh, can you guys see that all right? Should you enter one more? Might want to, like, hit enter one time. Yeah, there you go. Is that all right? Yep, that's great. Okay, cool. So we should be able to do the Lambda shell, and then, so I'm, I'm calling from my laptop into, uh, 
and just make it a curl command to, to, the, the, to the API gateway, which then the API gateway is routing that to the Lambda. Uh, there's not, I don't have a lot of traffic on it, so I should be able to even show like container reuse and stuff like that. Um, but let's just like, let's just ask for, um, uh, oh, I gotta put in, uh, I have to like use uh, HTTP and encoding there for, uh, for the, anything I put across there, so. All right. All right, so we're, we got a, a Lambda that, and this is kind of what it's reporting is its uname. Um, we can say uh, uh, ls dash, uh, just like to see what's in, what's, uh, sometimes I get these. Ls. Oh, geez, yeah, well, that's, that, would, that would also do it. Thank well, you. Well, I think people are actually paying attention. This is pretty awesome. Uh, let's see here. Oh, oh. Let's see. No, it's kind of like, it's a little flaky, the, uh, let's see. So this is an open source project, and so we could use some help with uh, making it better. Yeah, so yeah, sometimes like the, the Lambda's refresh, I, I don't know, I don't know, I haven't debugged like why every now and then I get these little error connections and, and whatever, but yes, yeah, so you can kind of see some of the stuff in there. Uh, we can also look in um, ls-la, uh, what, uh, temp, let's see what's in temp. Okay, so nothing's in there now. Um, we can go ahead and like, um, so like one of the things like for, for uh, lambdas, right? It's like you, you write it and then uh, uh, lambda supposedly like goes away and, and sort of sits like in warm idle state for like five minutes and then another person will come in and then they, they execute. The only place on disk you can write is to slash temp, but like, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's some like Xfil stuff. There's some, some good talks I've seen in the security space of like how to kind of like you know, it, you know, inject uh, lambdas for future use. I mean, it's a little bit sketchy on how you could do it, but uh, let's we'll, we'll kind of look at it. So let's uh, say in slash temp, we'll say uh, Karthik was here. Oh, All thanks, right. man. All right, let's see. Let's see if that works. All right, and then um, let's take a look at temp again. So unless anybody else is hitting it, like we got, we actually got rebalanced back to the same uh, lambda as before. So we're seeing the the container reuse, um, what else? Uh, and, and you can look at, I mean, you can look at anything else on the, the file system, so. Um, right, um, right so, yeah. Oh, oh then you, uh, the other thing I was like, oh, you could also, um, and maybe other people have other ideas for this, but I was like, we, we have, um, Uh, you know, like does does what what else is on here? Oh, I have curl, so maybe I could make my own like little cheap uh, proxy here, right? So I could say uh, curl uh, example dot com, and then um, I'm able to get uh, through that. You know, so you, c you can start doing like weird stuff. And I know that like that's not what lambdas are built for or whatever, but like there is still an OS under there. You're still mm -hmm. messing with it. Yeah, the containers are getting swapped out by the provider. Um, but here I am, I'm just entering, you know, stuff in a, you know, a, an HTTP, uh, you know, query string, and I'm able to kind of do command injection and break out of, out of control here. So, so. that's kind of crazy, because you're going, this is running in your Lambda function on AWS, so you're like hopping to it. Yeah, and through the, AP, through the API gateway, which was my, which was a big thing, because I was, I was trying to prove to a friend of mine, I was like, it was like, hey, the API gateway, like, all it does is just route, it just routes. So like, and, and I think that we, we sort of think of, uh, security, a lot of times we approach it from the, like the OS level, and one mm -hmm. of the cool things with Lambdas is like you kind of are, are done with having to deal with a lot of that sort of stuff, like so shell shock and heart bleed and all, the, all that, that business, like less important. Stuff like OWASP and anything like uh, application security stuff, way more important. Like I think we're gonna see a renovation of, of interest uh, of, and, and how like OWASP like just becomes a lot more important, so. All right, so I think we will keep on with the, uh, the, the talk here, let's go back to this. All right, so I think that's like all those. And if you're interested in it, like I, I'd be happy to like get you started. And we, we could totally use like a UI. We could show, it'd be better if we had like cross-site scripting and some other examples uh, and things like that. So this is very like proof of concepty and like not exactly where we'd like to go. Um, I was talking with uh, Jason White, who's in the, the OWASP community and we were we're both threatening each other to like do more work together on this. <laughs> and so I don't know if this is gonna happen or not, but, but maybe it will. Um, 
But I think that we, some of, the, some of the thoughts I had from dealing with this is like, okay, Lambda has a lower blast radius, but it's not zero. Uh, how are you gonna know if any of this sort of stuff's happening? Like uh, Karthik mentioned this earlier, monitoring logging, uh, which is on the OWASP top 10, but it's like that plays a key piece here. Uh, also think about it, like if you got all the lambdas to, uh, you know, if I just typed in there sleep for, uh, I don't know, 300 seconds, um, like, you, and then you just said, and run that, you know, uh, a thousand times, you know, in bash, mm -hmm. like, I could just like turn off your whole lambda infrastructure, uh, you know, to just be, be spinning out of control, uh, and you, you kind of hit the limits there. Uh, yeah, so you get you get error. You can check for higher rate error occurrences because when you did all that, like it was still kind of noisy, even though we already had it already kitted out. And uh, anyways, and log all your actions of your lambdas. Okay, those are some some high th high level thoughts on AppSec stuff. Yeah, and that's like that's all of the stuff that you write. So that's all the code you write, and that that those are all the things that you kind of have um, you know access to. What about everything that you inherit, right? So like all the dependencies and stuff like that that you get from. Uh, different applications. So um, a lot of times we, you know, when we write code, we're like, oh yeah, you have to write this thing. You're like, okay, um, you know, and this is an example uh, that comes from Sync, but um, uh, there was this example where oh, they ended up writing, uh, you know, 200, oh, okay, uh, like 222 lines of code, and it's like it had uh, five dependencies, and um, Sorry, man. And then we had technical difficulties. But uh, basically, uh, you know, it's pretty common. You're like, I gotta write something. I'll get all these dependencies in there, and then I'll have have the application up and running. And so we, we uh, when we do that, you know, it's like it might be you know a main method with like this much code. So uh, when they ended up doing that, it was like 200, 200 lines of code. And then uh, when they kind of exploded that out, it was actually like four hundred sixty thousand lines of code, including all the dependencies and the you know, the yeah. yeah, in, in yeah. Java, sometimes you're like uh, one, uh, your POM XML, like you, one thing depends on another and becomes like even bigger. So it was actually like 460,000 lines of code uh, in the end, which is a little bit crazy. So um, there was a study done uh, by, by the folks at Sync, and uh, most defect density studies basically say that when you have like 1,000 lines of code, uh, you either have, you know, at least half a mistake or like 10 def or uh, half a mistake or 10 uh, mistakes, so it's between 0.5 and 10. Yeah, and you can go all the way back to like the 70s and the 80s where people have been doing this, and like, you, you, the, there's, you're always seeing some sort of thing. It doesn't matter like what uh, language or framework you're doing, it's like humans create errors when they write code. Right, and the most important thing is like, we've gotten better over time, but the problem is that it's not zero, right? We're, we're not, as, as people, we're not error free. We, you know, sometimes make mistakes. And the, the trouble with this is that vulnerabilities also are just exploitable defects. So they're not like something different. They're just like mistakes that we, we make uh, and they just end up become defects. So um, uh, you want to talk about- This is your life now. This, this, this <laughs> is kind of your life now. And, and this, is part of the game that, this is part of the game we've been playing before, yep. but now this has definitely moved into the application scope. You're, you're not, you stop worrying about the like, you know, open SSL version on your host or whatever, but like, what libraries you've sucked into your, your Java app or, or whatever mm -hmm. it is, like that, that matters, right? So, uh, you know, we've talked about known vulnerabilities with components, what you do, what you, do, do. Uh, you want to be able to monitor the dependencies continuously. There are a lot of strategies that we get from the container side of things. So if you're using, you know, Docker containers uh, and you're using a registry behind the scenes, like use some of the products out there like Harbor or whatever, or, you know, talk to, um, uh, talk to your cloud provider to see what they have. Um, and next, we'll kind of talk about like security misconfiguration, uh, and so this has kind of become more and more common over time. Where uh, you know, if you're working in AWS and you're trying to like do all this uh, config stuff in there, you end up making like a bunch of mistakes. So uh, permissiveness. Well, yeah. Can I say when I, yeah. when I when I first started writing lambdas, like mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'm going to do this like the secure way, and like I locked down permissions, oh. and then. And then started and it's like, okay, got one error, need to open up that permission, got another one to open up that permission. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, like, I gave up, right? I was like, star dot star, like, yeah. you know, because like, I actually needed to get work done and I need to get these <laughs> things out. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so, I and, and uh, you know, I, I like to think that I care about security, but at that moment, I did not. I was like, I will go back and fix this, which is the promise we all, all developers make all the time, right? Well, yeah, it's like, this application worked and it doesn't work now. I don't know what yeah. happened. Like, just yeah. tear everything apart to just make it work because I have a demo in like 20 minutes. That's right. Um, but, you know, we kind of make this mistake a lot. So, uh, things that you can do to, you know, uh, clean out a little bit better 
is, uh, you know, think about your blast radius, right? So uh, before you make whatever choices you're making, think about how bad that scenario could be. So thinking about it upfront is actually like a good way to kind of limit, um, you know, how massive you the mistake uh, would actually be. Uh, use uh, when you're using, you know, Lambda or uh, whatever, um, you know, make sure you use uh, the the hardened security uh, advice that your provider gives you or the provider configurations. So it's kind of generic and specific to different providers. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and I'll also, um, we talked about scanning your containers. Uh, also consider like scanning your, uh, your buckets. So like whether they have global read, read write access, because mm -hmm. a lot of times we'll leave things completely open and we don't we like totally forget about that. Uh, there's an idea of the principle of least privilege. So if something doesn't need uh, access over, uh, if something doesn't need like enough access, like don't give it, uh, you know, complete access to ev everything. Uh, and then enterprise, for enterprises, uh, this is becoming more uh, common uh, from enterprise to enterprise, but use a multi-factor authentication when you're trying to access the console or even different applications. It's like becoming a standard practice everywhere and there are plenty of ways to do that. Um, so the most common attacks, I was doing some research on this for, uh, you know, for Lambdas and also for Cloud Native, uh, and there's like basically, everybody knows like, uh, you know, crypto mining, that's kind of like the most common thing that everybody uses, uh, you know, vulnerable code for, or vulnerable uh, applications, containers, et cetera. There's also uh, hijacking business flows, and this was interesting, because like, uh, this was, uh, instead of going from, you know, because they're all microservices, one function calling another function, they were able to go from like one function calling something else and just like orchestrating a different kind of business flow altogether. So uh, make sure you have different kind of authentications behind things to make sure things are okay. Uh, denial of wallet uh, is an interesting idea. It's where, you know, it's kind of like denial of service, but all of these things are, you know, you're, you're paying for every call. So you can, you know, try and like make sure, or you can try and, uh, if, you, if you orchestrate your, uh, or architect your software in a bad way, there's a chance that it'll become like a really expensive kind of operation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like like in the past, like denial of service, like you mm -hmm. just bring down the site. Now it's like, and yep. now you get a twenty thousand dollar credit card bill because you. Right, and yeah. it would be. I mean, for simple lambda lambda applications, it would be really hard because they're really really cheap. But if you're doing something crazy behind the scenes, that's where you know you get into mm -hmm. trouble. Uh, and also data misconfiguration. So that's exploiting the uh, your your data in in weird ways. So we'll talk about uh, the. From, so we talked about um, you know all of the uh, stuff that you get. What about platform, right? So all of these things run on different cloud providers. So here's a quick um, a quick talk through like all the different things that you can do from a provider perspective. So we'll do AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, and uh, OCI. Okay. We'll yeah, yeah. And we'll try to we'll try to hit through these pretty quick. We're yep. no lunch is upon us. Uh, so Amazon, uh, one of the talks I would recommend checking out. That's uh, I think is pretty interesting. There's a lot of focus on uh, IAM privileges and things like that in the talk, and uh, but I, I totally recommend it. It's called Gone in 60 Milliseconds. Uh, watch it. I've watched it a couple times. I always find it super fascinating and, and the stuff that, uh, that you're able to do with kind of Lambda and uh, IAM roles and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, the, n the net of it's like what we've always been doing is like focus on like good uh, IAM roles, policies, and hygiene, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is, is really good. So, I mean, here's some like good hygiene tips that we sh should always find. I'm sure like... There's some Amazon pros in the audience that are like, yeah, there's here's probably 10 other. Like, um, the, the thing is, like, Amazon lets you roll your own security in a lot of cases. And we, even when you think of, like, let's say I want to take, like, a traditional or just take a web app and I'm going to run my web app in Lambdas and kind of, a, you know, a, a sundry of services to kind of build this serverless thing. Um, I can also build my own security in this. They released, uh, like, this uh, blueprint, like, uh, uh, I guess, in, like, in December. But this is a, you, you got a, uh, the API gateway, which like looks, uh, and it has a Lambda handler that looks for bad bots and scrapers and SQL injection cross-site scripting. It also has a Lambda for like log parsing to see if like you're getting scanners and probes and other junk like that hitting you. Uh, it has, uh, you can now, then you just make an Amazon CloudWatch event that like goes out to like reputation feeds and lists and then pulls those in. And now you have known attacker protection through this like list parser. Um, yeah, what else? Is oh, then they have a, they had another one up here that I thought was uh, particularly interesting um, uh, with uh, honeypots. Uh, so you see, like uh, right there, if anything comes in the honeypot, like that gets uh, that gets flagged, and you get to know that as well. So you, you see a lot of this stuff, and like the, you see some of these mechanics. And uh, a friend of mine who's like working on a project, uh, Honey Pie, like you know, we were talking about this, and it's like it's great, but like this is actually like decently 
complex, and it still sort of speaks the language of security. And like, mm -hmm. uh, you, you start like trying to look at this, and you're like, "What is all this junk?" You know, and that kind of that kind of leaves you uh, with a problem because now you're you're choosing your own adventure with your own honeypot. You're doing your own scanning things. You're parsing your own reputation list. You're dealing with all this, uh, all these components, and now you're sort of back where you started from in a lot of in a lot of ways. So it's not a friendly setup for devs or ops, and so. I think there's more work in the provider stuff, just from that simple thing that we have to do. And I felt like what we talked about earlier, like as as you go and you build some of the things as a security person, you're like, oh, like developers, like yeah, you do start out start a lot mm -hmm. of things because uh, and you start having that empathy that kind of rolls over whenever you whenever you experience that. All right. So we'll go over. Um, I think we're we're out of time, but I'll hit these a uh, couple things real quick. Um, so I I did some digging on the Azure side. So. Uh, all of these things are links, so when you get the slides, take a look at the, Azure has a really interesting uh, security policy that, you know, they kind of publish that, the best practices mm -hmm. from that, so take a look at that. Um, also, they have a key vault service, so if you're trying to do key management, uh, you know, it's a great idea to use uh, like a key vault service. Uh, Google Cloud, very similar. Uh, uh, they also, like AWS, have IAM best practices, so take a look at those. Uh, Google has a security command, so um, that's also a link on here. Uh, and they have a bunch of like storage best practices. That's it's specific for Google, but you can also like kind of use those same ideas for Amazon. Oh, we have five minutes. Okay, cool. Uh, on the Oracle side, since I come from OCI, uh, we have you know um, we have IAM, but we also have this idea of compartments. So like I talked about blast radius earlier on. So when you uh, designate a specific compartment to do uh, whatever you whatever you want to in there, you and you know something gets compromised, it's only that single compartment that you know is. Um, is uh, ends up being compromised, so you can like delete that or whatever, and kind of continue on your day. Um, also, uh, you know, you can do a bunch of things like uh, Oracle targets enterprises, right? So a lot of people kind of uh, accessing a bunch of stuff in the cloud console. So you can do like uh, specific limiting to users and groups, etc. Uh, from that perspective. Um, moving on. So what happens when you roll your own? I can't remember if this is. I think this is still mine. Yeah. So you. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Still my slide. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're, so you're you know, like Kubernetes uh, security guy. So that, that's true. Okay. Don't put that to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to I was trying to pawn <laughs> something off and it didn't work. All right. So uh, if you're trying to roll your own, because uh, you know you might not want to be like vendor locked in uh, using a specific framework from vendors. There's a bunch of them. Don't like go and write your own serverless thing. Like use you know Knative or OpenPass or FN or something like that on top of whatever provider you're running on. Uh, from a Kubernetes perspective, so um, a lot of the, like if you take OpenFast or FN for example, they actually deploy on top of Kubernetes. So um, there's, uh, you know, Kubernetes itself is kind of really large. It will probably have like an open space about that, and, like best practices about what you should do from a Kubernetes security perspective. So um, just because you're using Kubernetes, like don't use vanilla Kubernetes. Make sure you're thinking about security from, from that perspective as well. Uh, to deploy your serverless stack on top of. Uh, I gave a webinar with Signal Sciences, or if you search for, if you look at my uh, tweet stream, you'll find a bunch of stuff on cloud native security that I talk about. Yep. Yeah, Karthik has great stuff on that, and I, when I was at Signal Sciences, I was like, hey, come on over here and give a webinar for this, and it, it was really great, so. Uh, let's see, this, I think this is yours. Uh, uh, yeah, sure, yeah, so uh, what are some pitfalls? I mean, hey, I know a lot of people that are like, yeah, we do this, we do Kubernetes and serverless, but do we don't tell the auditors? And you're like, uh, we don't. And they're like, yeah. no, because like they would, they would, they would have a problem with that, you know. And it's like, uh, and they're big, yeah. big companies are doing this kind of stuff, and uh, uh, so, and that's uh, common. And we're laughing because we know that it's true. We would not tell mm -hmm. them, right? Um, I, I found just a general lack of instrumentation in a lot of places. Uh, yep. the, the lack of security controls uh, in your your pipeline. Uh, how how stuff gets out uh, from you know developers uh, uh, laptops to like actually deployed in, in lambdas, uh, and kind of how you build out that pipeline. Again, that's another like roll your own experience. Experience. So uh, you got to make sure you secure that properly. Uh, dealing with provider config, all that sort of stuff. But we've seen kind of like we're, we're our concerns have kind of transferred to just different layers, right? Um, and uh, oh yeah, I, ha I have this uh, thought about like how we how we think about security and how security kind of uh, you know. G gets out of that jam they're in where they're mm -hmm. 110 to 1. So looking at how does security build influence, so find misutilization in your organization, uh, look for places for feedback loops and telemetry, uh, put the automation in place where it makes sense in your pipeline, uh, and then you kind of influ influence broadly more organizational culture. It's kind of like a team-by-team -team approach and then overall uh, way. So 
Uh, and I think uh, security's new playbook is, is kind of looking where, uh, going forward with speed, uh, don't block. I had a friend who called me one day, he's like, ah, oh, this DevOps thing, like, what am I going to do about it, you know? And I'm like, well, you're never going to say no ever again. He's a security guy. Right. And he's like, he's like, oh, geez, I don't know about that. Um, so, so thinking, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, let's walk together versus, yeah. you know, being adversaries. Yeah. We all yeah. work at the same company. Anyways. Yeah, have empathy, uh, try to make security as normal. So, anyways, w we'd love to uh, keep in touch with y'all. Uh, here's our uh, Twitter handles, or just, just find us or grab us uh, mm -hmm. afterward. And, uh, and thanks for, for the time. So. Thank you. Right. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for that.